Plantaria Group and I'm going to be talking to you today about biophilic design. Um, so what I want to to cover in this presentation is it's it's a very broad um, presentation about biophilic design and I hope you'll get a lot out of it. It might be that I'm sure that you're coming to this presentation with already some some good ideas about what what biophilia means, what biophilic design is. I'm sure you've read about it, but I want to cover this in the broadest terms possible and consider the various factors and why I think this is such an important topic, not just for us as human beings um, and how we can uh, live a, a better life, because if we if we consider these points, but for your clients um, for the outcomes in the work that you do, um, I think it's it has a, a far reaching um, effects. So we're going to cover why is biophilia in our DNA? How is it connected to us as humans? Its impacts on health and well-being, the happiness factor, retention and productivity. I'm going to look at some different sectors and um, and some case studies that have been done that really dig deep into the benefits of including good biophilic design. Um, and even what the value is it uh, of it is. And I also want to cover some of the sticking points. So please do feel free to um, leap in and add your comments and, and give me some feedback on if you have uh, attempted to design in uh, biophilic design and you've had a pushback from clients for whatever reason that might be. But most of all, I'd like you to go away from this presentation feeling that you can really be a champion of biophilia and that you really want to improve um, outcomes for people by including some simple um, effective steps. So where did it all begin and who who um, coined the phrase biophilia? When was it first used? Well, the word biophilia was actually used um, all the way back in 1964 uh, for the first time by a German social psychologist um, called Eric Fromm. Um, but this chap here, Edward O. Wilson, is really given credit for making this a household term. So Edward O. Wilson started off life as a mammologist studying ants um, and ant colonies and spent a lot of his time in rainforests. And he's, he was pondering on how um, important ants are as, as a, a one species and how all species are interconnected, the importance of biodiversity, and how we as humans fit into that landscape as another species on the planet, and how we perhaps don't always see ourselves like that. We see ourselves as sort of the top of the food chain as, as being in control of everything on the planet and clearly we're not we just play a part in that ecosystem and he's still working to this day he's now in his late 80s and um he ha he's very much an environmentalist now but this book um his book on the subject biophilia is a twice pulitzer prize winning book so absolutely fascinating and the word biophilia means love of living life, living things and life forms. So the word bio meaning life and the philia, the love of something, which is the opposite of a phobia. So if you are considering buying that book, I would recommend you go ahead. It's not a very long book. It's beautifully written. So why is it then that biophilia is so important to us as humans? And how is it connected to our, D our uh, why have we got it ingrained in our DNA? And to, to consider this topic, you need to really think back to our earliest ancestral selves and consider how successful we've been as a species. Wherever we've moved to in the world, we have thrived. No matter what the climate is, we've found a way to, to, to really do well. And part of our ability to do this is the fact that we understand or we, ha we have learned what is important to help us thrive, what is good for us. And, and we have a natural love of anything that helps us to thrive and survive and do, do well as and flourish as a species. So when you look at this image here, this is a, a savannah view, um, an African savannah view, which is where human the human race started. 
And this is said to be the most attractive view to us as humans, the spatial configuration of the savanna view. So when you break this down, what are we actually looking at? We're looking at a wide open vista. We have um, a, a good vantage point. So we're up high looking out across. We've got an unencumbered view. What we know from this is that we're safe. We're not about to be attacked by any hidden um, dangers. We can also see that we've got pasture land and right to the horizon here, we can see rolling fields and we've got a green colour, the, the green plants, which indicates to us an abundance. Um, the fact that we might be able to cultivate food here, we might be able to forage for food here. Certainly we can hunt, we can see the animals in the foreground there. And what would make this Im image even more attractive to us is if there was a body of water in it, because again, water is so essential for our survival. So if we look at this next image, this is more of a westernised savanna view, something that we're maybe more familiar with um, in Europe. And I think that if you look at this image, you'll and if this was what you were looking at from your house, from your living room window, your kitchen window, that you'd agree that you'd pretty much hit the hit the jackpot on your location. Now, when I ask people what they think of, how they feel when they look at this kind of image, I normally get a few of the same words come up and people. I mean, you can write a word down even if you what is it that this picture, this this pasture view is making you feel? Now, most people tell me that's making them feel peaceful or relaxed. So if that was a word that you wrote down, um, then you're with the majority. And interestingly, when you ask people to imagine themselves, if you're taking them through a hypnosis process and you want to put somebody into a deeply relaxed state before you start to make suggestions to them, then you would say, imagine yourself somewhere that you feel peaceful and relaxed. And then if you ask them to tell you what they've pictured, the majority of people, over 90 percent of people will tell you that they're in a park, they're in a garden, they're by the sea, they're on a beach. Um, and so the natural connection and that feeling of peacefulness and relaxation are very closely connected. Now, here's another compelling and interesting fact around what we've just been talking about is that people will pay up to 127 percent more for a property with a view to water. Now, what we know about this is that clearly we've got a preference for this kind of view, especially views with water, that we're prepared to pay a premium. And as you know, if you think back to when we could travel and book holidays, we would pay, we would expect to pay a premium for a hotel room with a pool view and you'd be, you'd expect to pay more still if you were looking for a beach or sea view. So we know that this isn't, it's, it's a preference, right? It's doing something to us emotionally, so much so that we're actually prepared to pay this much more money um, for a property. So you could take the same house from a suburban street, move that exact same property next to a lake, next to a river, canal or, a, or the sea, and that you would pay that much more of a premium for it. So what's this doing to us? How do we know that this isn't just a, just a preference? What is it doing to us um, physically? And uh, a, this a study has been done to look at this. So in the study, a group of um, participants were shown images of spatial configurations which had connections to nature like, like the ones we've just looked at compared to spatial configurations of the built environment with no connection to nature. And where the um, images were of a connection to nature, there was a lot more activity going on in the part of the brain associated with pleasure. So a real um, actual physical effect happening from looking at those images. Now, other spatial configurations that we know that people like um, are uh, that that sensation of refuge, being safe um, and being tucked away. And again, I think this is interesting. It takes us right back to the ancestral selves, where one of the key things we we know as humans and one of the key important things for us to survive is shelter. 
And so this, again, takes us back to that feeling of safety and security, the ability to have somewhere that we can take ourselves away. We know we're not going to be harmed. We can sleep peacefully. It's really important to us. And I think what's in interesting to look at how design has changed over the recent years and the and the fact that we love booth seating for workspaces, we love phone boxes, we love this whole idea of being able to take ourselves away somewhere private when we're given that opportunity in a workspace to have those kind of settings that we absolutely love them. And that, that again, stems from that, um, that desire, that need for us to have security and um, privacy as well. So biophilic design is, is not a new thing. And architects and designers have been using these techniques um, for many years and what and you might not think it think it um, necessarily but blue water shopping center is actually a great um, a great example of good biophilic design so when we're talking about biophilic design we're talking about all of our senses all of our five senses and the connection to um all of those natural elements. So when we're thinking about natural elements, we're thinking about light, natural light, um, color palettes that reflect nature, windows with views to nature. Um, we're also thinking about the spatial configuration and things like including plants and animals into the environment when we can. So here, when you're looking at this this image of, of, of uh, Blue Water Shopping Centre, you can see the spatial configuration is almost that savanna view, that eye line going right to the horizon. Very cleverly done here is um, Blue Water is built in a triangular shape. So at various points, you can have that far into the distance line of sight, which is um, echoed as well by the uh, the atrium. Um, you know, the, the open plan design, the fact that you can see from level one and from the ground floor, the, the natural lights in the ceiling, which again, draw your eye line to the horizon and the colour, you know, and the, also the, the stone marble, there's a nod to planting in the centre there as well with the, the bay trees. I don't know if they're real or artificial, but again, it gives you that sense of, of bringing nature into that space. And Blue Water also has its own watering hole. So in the evenings, people can be seated around there or, um, or the restaurants are in this area as well. And we've already spoken about the fact that this makes us using biophilic design, using water, things that we love. Um, these elements allow us to feel more relaxed and calm. And where we feel like that, we're more inclined to stay in those spaces for longer, consume more, spend more money and so of course if you're designing a retail setting you absolutely want to create that kind of environment so why is this important to and how does this connect to our health and well-being well, i think this is really the key point uh, that uh, that is often taken in isolation and we need to think holistically about how biophilia can help our clients, help us as, as humans, and help to solve some of the situations that we find ourselves in today. So we need to think about our autonomic nervous system, which essentially runs the show for us as humans, keeps us alive, has helped us. Again, one of the key things that's helped us to thrive as a species is the fact that we have this fantastic autonomic nervous system, which keeps us safe. So it's split into two parts. You've got the sympathetic nervous system, which is the the um, fight or flight side of our nervous system and you have the parasympathetic nervous system which is the rest digest and repair side of our nervous system and those two sides need to work together in harmony to, to keep us in a state of homeostasis to keep us in a, a balanced state however what ha what can happen is this can easily get out of balance so the, the the sympathetic side the fight or flight side incredibly important keeps us safe if something happens if there's a sudden danger to us in our um in our environment if for example how this might work now if you are about to cross the road and a car or a motorbike whizzes past your this side will switch right on and your response will be jump onto the pavement and get away from that danger. You do that without necessarily even thinking about it. 
But what is also interesting here is that this side of our nervous system can also perceive threats which may or may not be real. So it allows us to imagine worst case scenarios. And right now, living through a pandemic, this part of our nervous system has been tuned all the way up. So we're listening to the news, we're at home, we're being bombarded by social media, um, all kinds of bad, bad news and warning messages about what's going on economically, um, you know, ecosystems crumbling, illnesses, all kinds of things have been floating around in the news. And what we do as humans is we imagine worst case scenarios that might evolve, in, include our families, ourselves, our financial situations, because quite rightly so, as, as thinking intelligent species, animals don't do this, they don't forecast into the future what may or may not be happening for them. But as humans, we do that to plan, prepare and protect ourselves from dangers on the horizon or further down the line. But what this that then does is to cause all kinds of potentially dangerous health situations for us. So stress, mental and physical stresses um, create all kinds of, of illnesses. And before even the pandemic had happened, the World Health Organization had said that by 2020, stress would um, would be the major cause of both mental health disorders and cardiovascular disease worldwide by 2020. And some of the um, illnesses that can be brought on by or worsened by stress, which is what, what we're talking about, is health, uh, heart disease, high blood pressure, um, asthma can be worsened, obesity created by unhealthy coping mechanisms, eating the wrong kinds of food, comfort eating, but also by a constant heightened uh, level of cortisol, which is caused, to, which allows us to stay switched on and in high state of alert. Um, depression and anxiety, which can ultimately lead to nervous breakdowns, uh, acid reflux, IBS. Um, ulcers, stomach ulcers, and also accelerated aging by up to 17 years. So a really serious situation. And something that's also been very much in the news is um, mental health and being aware of our mental health um, and the connection between getting outside into nature to cope with that um, and, um, you know, or not, uh, as it is, you know, managing our mental our mental health issues. So to, to look at that a little bit further, how can our environment really help us or hinder us in in this situation of stress and mental health? And if we look here at a really good example of how how bad zoos were back in the 1970s and the 19 early 1980s and still are in a lot of places in the world when we built zoos and we put animals into um, small confined spaces which had no connection to their natural environment now what we saw when we did that was that animals were highly stressed they were hair pulling rocking pacing and you could see that they were not happy in those environments but at the same kind of time in the 1970s and the 1980s, we built small and stressful and sparse habitats for humans to inhabit as well. And um, small cubicleized offices, offices with no natural lighting, um, perhaps with uh, very beige carpets and walls. And I know that I worked in an environment like this um, back in the 1990s um, where people would be walking around smoking as well with um, no, no windows that could even be opened. And I'm sure that you have heard of sick building syndrome, but this is exactly what happened when you put people in those kind of environments. Not only did they feel stressed out, uh, but they also were um, physically unwell. Um, so you'd start the day feeling OK. Maybe on Monday morning you'd feel all right. And by Tuesday afternoon, you felt dreadful. It felt like you were coming down with the flu, had a headache, felt sick. Um, and then Friday, if you made it through to Friday without taking any time off sick, you'd go home exhausted and you might start to feel OK again Sunday and you'd be back to square one again on Monday. So it's a very real uh, problem. 
So how can we create better spaces? Well, for a start, we share the same, um, we're 95.5% the same DNA, or it might even be more than that. Actually, let me have a quick look back at my notes. Um, we share 98.8% uh, um, the same DNA as chimpanzees. So we aren't so dissimilar, and we certainly do get affected by stress when we're disconnected from nature and put into small sparse environments. And again, we saw this during the pandemic when people were locked into their homes and they weren't able to access outside spaces uh, you know, that was a big coping mechanism for a lot of people was being able to get outside and exercise in nature or sit in their garden. And if they weren't able to do that for any reason, they really suffered a lot more. Um, and that's a proven fact. So we know how important that is. But we also know that um, that people that spend even just 20 minutes a day is, is the gold number or 120 minutes a week in nature have much better health outcomes and better longevity. And this is actually being prescribed by some GPs now as part of a holistic approach to better health. So as well as saying to people, right, you need to give up smoking, lose a few pounds, um, a lot of GPs are prescribing regular exercise, walks in nature to connect yourself with the outside world. So as well, it's not just about the exercise, it's about where you do it. Um, so we spend over 90 percent of our time inside in the UK. That's because obviously we have pretty rubbish weather a lot of the time. And it's also difficult to do a lot of our jobs outside we're working off in an office or working at a desk using a computer that's not very easy to do in the garden so we need to design better spaces that bring the outside in so very briefly i'm going to go through now the three pillar concepts of biophilia based design you might have heard some of these terms already so just what does that mean and how can you easily do it so there's three pillar concepts to the biophilia biophilic based design, nature in the space, natural analogues and nature of the space. And I'll be taking you through some case studies of work that we've done for our clients so you can see some good images of how we help people do this. Nature in the space is very simple and easy to do. You literally bring natural elements into the built environment. It might be that you're doing doing this um, you know, retrospectively or a refurbishment, a refit can be done at any stage, um, but trees and plants. And it's also interesting and, and useful to consider the impact of the view from windows. So you can't move a building that's already built and that doesn't have a view. But what you can do is to use your roof spaces and terraces and outdoor areas and make those more attractive and also accessible so that people can get outside and sit outside and make that a green oasis. Also, things like fish tanks, which we don't do, but other people do, um, pets, uh, living walls, all of those things are great for including a, a lot more uh, natural elements into the environment. The second pillar is natural analog. So this is one degree removed from true nature. We're talking there about representational artwork, ornamentation, biomorphic form, the use of natural materials, um, wood grain, stone, marble. Um, artificial planting also fits into this uh, category. And then the third is nature of the space, which is about the spatial configuration. So we've already talked about this in terms of we know that um, the uh, savannah view is is very um, popular. We love that as humans. We also love views with water in. Um, we love views onto nature. So as much as possible, if we can incorporate uh, the, the windows into our design then that's fantastic but as humans we also have a desire for risk and peril and exploration so if you can also weave this into your design then that's um, fantastic too so the risk and, and peril and mystery um, we can see some great examples here of that feeling that sensation where we can uh, we, we love climbing to the top of towers we love to look down a lot like it's like that sensation if you've climbed to the top of a mountain you've got a great view we love skyscrapers for this very reason to get up to the top of a skyscraper and look across like the king of the world 
we love it. And here on the right hand side, you can see this is the DEFRA building. This is one of our clients. And um, we have harness trained technicians that abseil down and look after all these plants on these different on these atrium levels. It's absolutely stunning. So what I'm going to do now is to take you through some case studies across different sectors and look at how great biophilic design has brought some real tangible benefits, um, which and although you may not work in all of these sectors, um, what the common denominator here is, is that the outcomes for the people in these environments are so beneficial that you would want to have these outcomes no matter what environment you were working in or living in. So um, the, the, you, you can use these techniques and these principles in any situation. It just happens to be that the, the case studies were, were, were looking at these particular sectors. So in the first sector, we're going to look at uh, this first sector that I'm looking at here is the healthcare sector. Now, lots of studies have been done um, in this sector, so it's quite a useful one to, to look at. And the key points here are the, the first study was done on a view to nature and how that could accelerate the healing process. So this particular study was a group of patients recovering from an operation and half the patients were put into rooms that had views out of the hospital onto parks, gardens, natural settings. Half the patients were put into hospital rooms which had no views. They were looking onto other parts of the hospital, brick walls or no windows at all. Now, those patients that had views onto nature recovered quicker and were able to be released from hospital 8.5% earlier. Now, you can't reconfigure a ready, an already built hospital building, but what you can do then is think, what's the next best thing? If you have no view, is the design of the room and including those um, biomorphic forms, artwork depicting nature, thinking about the colour palette in the room, thinking about um, you know the, the additional things that you can do to make that room have a better design quality and more links to nature. The second study, a similar study on the, the, this uh, was a group of patients recovering from surgery, took um, half the patients and put them into a, a bright uh, daylit room which was 46% um, brighter with natural daylight than the other half of the patients, which were put into darker rooms or rooms that had no natural daylight at all. Now, this looked at to measure um, their, their use of pain relief um, and their, their perception of pain, how sunlight affected their perception of pain. And those patients in the naturally daylit rooms used 22% less pain medication during their length of stay, which I think is quite phenomenal. Um, so, you know, it, you can think about this and how would it affect people in their day to day lives if they were suffering from any kind of ongoing illness or, or pain or headaches or any kind of conditions like that? How could you improve um, their day to day condition? So absolutely fascinating by such a simple thing as daylight. We also know that healing gardens um, are incredibly successful at helping to alleviate anxiety and help people feel calm. So where there are healing gardens, not only do you have the added benefit that other rooms in the hospital can have that view onto the healing garden, which we've already talked about as being a benefit, but the access to to be able to access a healing garden for either the patients or the visitors um, during their stay, those um, patients and visitors that were able to access healing gardens said that 95% of them said it helped them to cope with the visit and help them to feel calmer and less stressed. So the next sector I'm going to look at is um, biophilic design in schools. Now, again, such an important uh, environment. Our children's this, this is the second most influential environment that our children spend time in um, that because they're spending so much time in a in a school setting. It has a huge impact on them. And one of the main factors here is the importance of natural daylight. So when classrooms are well lit with natural daylight, 
children progress through the school curriculum 20 to 26 percent faster. Now, back in the 1970s, there were a lot, lot of porter cabins used as classrooms in state schools and quite often had no windows. And there was this theory as well that if you had too many windows, this would be a distraction from the children, take them away from their learning. You couldn't be further from the truth. It's so important. Not only do children progress through the school curriculum faster when they're taught in natural daylight environments, but they also do better on test results, which, which clearly is the whole purpose. If you want to, to have something tangible to take away from your school life, it is that you would leave with a good set of exam results. And also that they grow to their full potential. So over time, studies have been done that show that children that would, were taught in these daylight environments have better dental health and have and are, and are taller than um, comparison groups. And that's mainly because of the, the extra vitamin D that they're receiving by having more natural daylight. Now, another thing that we know as well is that um, teaching children in, in, uh, in school environments, they need to be able to get out and play and have space to play. And if that space is connected to nature, if they have a field, trees, um, you know, uh, natural playgrounds, then again, it's so beneficial to children. And I have a personal story, which I'll very briefly share with you, is that my son, when he reached year three, um, he might actually, probably year two going into year three, I, I suddenly had this message back from the school to say, we think your son has learning difficulties. And I was absolutely shocked. It could have, you know, completely flawed because I had never for one second thought that he had any kind of learning difficulties it just seemed like a normal normal son he's my second son so I already had a son so I kind of had something to measure him against and he was inquisitive meeting all his milestones talking to me interested in you know very interested in things not so interested in other things but the whole message was no we think he's got ADHD could maybe have autism not really sure he's not participating in lessons he's sitting under the desk he's being disruptive I was really horrified um, and the message the underlying message was take your son to the GP put him on Ritalin so that we can control him and he's not disturbing the other children so I was pretty horrified. Now, uh, luckily for me, around about the same time, the school introduced forest school and one day a week, all the children were able to go and play outside. And most of their lessons took place outside, regardless of the weather. And he was able to climb trees and whittle sticks and build fires and toast marshmallows and do maths outside by counting things that he'd found in the environment and building things. And almost within a few months, the problems that he was having within the classroom started to subside. And there's an amazing book by a, um, a, a writer called Richard Louvre called The Last Child in the Woods, which explores this topic about how children have a nature deficit in our in our day and age because they don't they aren't allowed to run free and play outside. They're very much kept safe indoors and given electronics and iPads and expected to sit still in classrooms for a you know, long time during the day, much more so than children of previous generations. And just how detrimental this can be for some children. And it's a really interesting topic. So if that's something that you're interested in, I would highly recommend that book. And also that, you know, if you're thinking about clients and, and working for clients that are building schools or or any environments that should be child friendly, then these are really great things to, to know about. Um, so we've talked about the retail sector. I won't go on too long about the retail sector. Just to say that um, we've already talked about how and why you'd want to include a greenery to make the place be more beautiful, to, to be attractive to people. We know that the, the high street is dying a death. And when we we want to still have a shopping experience, we want it to be just that. We want it to be an experience. We want to go somewhere that maybe is offering other things. So perhaps there's somewhere to eat. Perhaps there's live music. Maybe there's a cinema there. But it's going to look beautiful, Instagrammable. You know, everybody wants somewhere that, that uplifts them, makes them feel good. And we also know that when we include good biophilic design into public spaces, you get less 
antisocial behaviour, you get calmer, happier people who, who are better behaved, less loitering, less littering, less uh, pickpocketing, all of those kind of things um, are far less likely to happen. Something else that we know is that when we improve environments by adding these beautiful biophilic designs, we also improve the perception that people have of the value of, of, of the, um, the shops within that environment. So a group of shoppers were shown these different um, images, images like this where you can see um, trees. This is the Apple store with the trees inside and images of a much more standard retail setting without um, the, bi the biophilic design elements. And those uh, shoppers said that the, the, the biophilic designed uh, shop settings, they would expect to pay 20% higher for a convenient shopping item, 25% higher for general shopping and 15% more for speciality shopping. So if again, if you are looking at um, an environment like this for a client, then that makes really good sense to to build somewhere that has more um, green uh, credentials, looks better. And the workplace. And this is where we've very much grown our business from. So we started back in 1977 and uh, we did plants for office space. We now work across all sectors with different types of clients through architects and designers. Um, but this is where we really started. And we know that so much has changed. Much of it has been driven forward at a pace because of the fact that we've all been working at home now for a year. So, you know, we know it can be done. Uh, it's no longer a question of does agile working work? Agile working has had to work, but it's more a case of how will we embrace it going forward and how important will it be for things like um, a attracting and retaining staff, for giving people a better quality of life and for making people happier and healthier. So when we ask workers what do they want from the workspace and they tell us these very things, they tell us 64% want um, to make the world a better place. It's a priority for them to feel that they're actually creating, um, you know, adding value, doing something worthwhile and meaningful with their time. 88% want a collaborative work culture rather than a competitive one. 74% want flexible work schedules. 88% want work-life integration. So they want to be able to weave the two things together. Um, so we know that, that work that ch the, the changes to the workspace, workspaces are going to have to look better. They're going to have to connect the wellness piece um, if they're going to be comp you know, competitive with other companies that are, are doing the same thing. You only have to go into a shared workspace building like WeWork or, or Uncommon and see these plants. It looks amazing. And people are, that's the bar. The bar's been set. That's the standard. And um, employees know if they're going to swap from one company to another, they kind of expect that you're going to provide them with that kind of workspace. Now, as far as our clients go as well, we, we're working for people who are trying to create environments um, that really say something about them as a company and that, that do a job. You know, it's not just a place to work, but actually it's created to um, to give them the competitive edge to improve uh, the um, the the success of the company to show the green credentials of the company. So one of the things that we often hear is that our people are our biggest asset. We hear that from companies and certainly they're one of the most expensive assets for your company as well. So to give some balance and perspective on that across industry sectors, we spend on average 112 times the amount of money on our people. Um, costs as we do for example on our energy costs so isn't it therefore important that if that that's our most important asset that we're really supporting those people to do their best to be most creative um, to feel at their best and and be most productive as well um, and we know from from studies that biophilic design can actually affect absenteeism so 10 percent of employee absences can be attributed to architecture with no connection to nature and what does that cost? Well, we have the figures from the Office of National Statistics from 2018, and we know that that year um, sickness absence cost around um, 4.4 days per worker, £554 per worker. And the top four most common reasons for sickness absence were illness, musculoskeletal problems, um, other conditions such as food poisoning, but also mental health um, 
and depression and anxiety. And what we also know is that there's a lot of underreporting from that fourth bracket where people will have, feel overwhelmed, anxious, depressed, and they will call in and say, I've got a cold, or they'll call in and say, I've got food poisoning, because it's more socially acceptable to say that. And I'm, I'm glad to see that the that, that is being changed um, and people are becoming much more open about talking about mental health issues as being very valid. The final um, case stole, the final bit of uh, um, study work that I want to share with you is this time and motion study which started off to measure um, the pr productivity within the Sacramento municipality, uh, municipal district a utility call centre and to find out why some of the workers there were, were handling calls six to seven percent faster than other workers. So what they discovered when they were studying these call handlers was that those most effective fastest call handlers were looking out of a window with a view to nature. So it wasn't anything to do with their training. It wasn't anything to do with their predisposition, their, um, their the state of mind they were in. It was what they were looking at out of the window that was helping them to be more productive. So what the, 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 um, the, the, the uh, consultants decided that they would do as a result was reconfigure the workspace, move some of the small offices that were positioned by the window out of the way and make sure that all the call centre handlers were looking out of window with this view over the park. And what that, that cost was around $1,000 per, per employee, but the productivity savings averaged nearly $3,000 per employee and the initial payback was re was achieved within four months and there were ongoing um, productivity improvements uh, over the years. So really worth doing for them. Now, at this point, I'd be very happy to take any questions. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how other benefits of including planting in um, the work that we do and how that's become um, more, more of a key uh, point for things like BREAM, um, well building certification and well fit. So we can put plants anywhere and right now um, perhaps where you're putting plants is is even more important. So as people are looking to reconfigure office space, which has become very much uh, an important thing to do. So perhaps we aren't just looking at banks of desks now, but we're looking at more social spaces, breakout spaces, um, different kind of group environments where you maybe want to do different types of work. Um, then being able to do that effectively, cost effectively, plants can be a really useful tool in doing that. So um, having plant racking, plants that you can move around on casters, putting plants on walls, using dividers with planting, cabinet top planting, moss walls as a great way of adding a swathe of planting that takes, takes up no floor space. All of these can be fantastic things to do and we can certainly help with any of these elements. Plants will also help to improve air quality. They can absorb VOCs um, from air, from um, furnishings and printers and they take that in through their leaves and store that into their substrate. They can also imp increase oxygen levels and if you're working in an environment where you have sealed windows and air conditioning units and people are suffering from dry eyes um, dry throats then plants can help to humidify the air there as well. Now one of the things that's become really important for a lot of our clients is achieving the well certifications. And this has a quite high planting requirement. So for the gold standard, uh, we um, need to be able to cover 75% line of sight from 75% of, of the desk space to planting um, or cover 1% of the floor space with planting. And also using green walls is very popular for that as well. So if that's something that you're working on, we can absolutely help you to achieve that. They, we love working with architects and designers and we don't charge for the consultation service that we do. We definitely get our most exciting work working through designers and architects. 
and you often challenge us to do things that we've never done before and show us images of things that you would like to create and we can absolutely bring your vision to life. The earlier we get involved in a project, the more successful we can be in doing this because obviously there are lead times for ordering different types of planting and incorporating that into bespoke build cabinet tops and those kind of things which we can absolutely do or sourcing the right kind of containers. We can also um, spray any containers you like to the Pantone colour of your choice. So if you're working with difficult corporate colours or there's something that you want to bring in to your design, um, we can do that and that sometimes that's a really great way of tying in those difficult elements uh, but the like i say the earlier you can involve us in um, tenders and pitches if you think that that's going to be important for the client to talk about a particular type of planting or to talk about um, how the planting would be maintained we do the entire service from design through installation and then ongoing maintenance and we offer rental and maintenance, which is what most of our clients would go for, then we would absolutely be happy to go along to a pitch with you and handle any of those specifics or any of those questions. And so, for example, plants can be great for staff engagement. So if there's been a beautiful design going on for an office and the client really wants the buy-in of the staff, that they've done this great job of creating this environment of well-being, um, then we can help by including the, the, the reasons why we've chosen the planting, put that onto their intranet or go along and deliver a talk to them to support you on delivering the end results of that project um, and to really make sure that the, that the staff understand the whole of the thought process and why the office has been designed like it has. And we have found that's been really, um, really uh, appreciated by a lot of our big clients. So we've been also been working on things like reconfiguring the office space for social distancing. Um, that's been a bit of a, a, a key uh, trend as well. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think that this really concludes um, my presentation. I hope that you've enjoyed it and I would certainly um, be open to taking questions. If there's anything that you've heard about within the presentation that you want to know more about, then I'd be very happy to, or my colleagues would be very happy to talk to you about that as well. Uh, thank you, Katie. Um, does anyone have a question? Um, I do. Um, so in our project, we're doing an office refurb and um, public realm regeneration. Uh -huh. So we're adding a lot of planting and everything, which is probably the less uh, challenging area of the scheme because we also have a basement that has no natural daylight but we are planning to put hydroponic planting in there okay. and so I was wondering if you had any experience in this and if you could give us any tips yes we do we do absolutely do hydroponic planting do I suppose the question will be is what what kind of lighting you have because some plants will be all right mm -hmm. um with you know electric lighting with with fluorescent lighting they'll be fine with that the key thing there is to make sure that lighting is on throughout the year so things like if the office is shut down over christmas then to make sure that lighting is on if you're using real plants because they do okay. need light for, um, for some of that so if they've got if they're on automatic on off switches and they go off and stay off all over the weekend or over christmas then the plants really suffer badly from that and, and it would also make sure that you're using plants that like low level of light so mm -hmm. things like snake plants for example mother-in-law's tongue um, yeah. is one of the key plants that do really well in low light levels and we we can, we can provide advice and help with that as well yeah. so um, if you're not engaging with a plant supplier already we can absolutely help you with that and okay. also you might want to think about if, if you are going to be suffering from some of those light off problems is to think about using artificial which we also do so anything that we do for uh, for our clients in real we can also provide an artificial mm -hmm. and and can still be really a, a, a good second option um, and we also use them in things like where you've got light fittings or um, you've got wiring or carpet and you need to be really careful with the client's soft furnishings. 
um, then sometimes, you know, rather than having a living wall, for example, an artificial living wall give you a great close second best kind of result, but not damage their expensive carpet with things dropping off the wall. So mm-hmm. um, it's just worth, you know, always talking through those options if there's any of those concerns we can give you some advice and help you with that okay um one of my colleagues who she couldn't make this call she'll Mm -hmm. she will probably email you with questions (laughs) absolutely be happy to talk it through thank you um i have a quick question um do you put together maintenance regimes because all these things look wonderful to start with. It's actually quite hard to keep them looking wonderful. Yeah. Yes, we do. We absolutely do. We do the whole service so we can help you design the right kind of plants for the environment. So you could provide us, for example, with an image of what you want and we could have a look at the site and say, we can provide you with these. These plants won't do well here, but we can find ones that are similar that will work in those light levels or those heating conditions or whatever it might be. And most of our clients will go for a rental and maintenance option, which spreads the cost, takes the plants out of the capex, puts it in the offsets budget and um, will also mean that those plants are then our responsibility to look after for the term of the contract, which is normally three years, for example. And if anything f- fails within that period, then we're responsible for replacing it. Um, and we have a technician which will visit the site and um, depends on the client and um, I mean, in some really big sites, we'll be there every day. In some really big sites, we have somebody permanently on site for them. Depends on how many plants they've got. But absolutely making sure that everything's watered, fed, pruned um, and maintained. OK, thank you very much. And they're also incentivized. Our technicians are incentivized on how the client scores us on their satisfaction results. So if they score well, first um, providing a really great service, then they get paid a bonus for that. Very good, thank you. Any other questions? I, I think that's it done for today. I mean, uh, that, that book that you recommended is already in my basket on Amazon. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so thank you. It, it looks like a good read. Yeah, um, absolutely. It actually reminds me a little bit of a book that I had to read during my, I think, part one or part two. Uh, so Human an Animal by, um, there was a French author, René something. Um, but uh, yes, he's a microbiologist and it was a an interesting take also how technology is, you know, ha- has an impact on us as, yeah. as animals. So I yeah, think, yeah absolutely. And he, to this one as well. Definitely. <laughs> and he's, he's a great person to follow as well on LinkedIn mm. because he's, he quite often comes on and talks about things that he's been doing. And um, I love the fact that uh, you're talking about Richard Louvre. Richard Louvre is, is also um, very much um, believes that this is just a, a, a part of the holistic picture of sustainability corporate social responsibility all these things are go hand in glove you know you can't kind of have one without the other it's it's um it's mm-hmm. important it's so important for us for our own well-being and also for the planet that we think about all these things um, with design yeah definitely no thank you very much it was a really good presentation and uh We've got your contact details, so I'm sure that uh, you know quite a few people will reach out and uh, with questions regarding Fantastic. their projects. Fantastic, that's great. Please do. It'd be lovely to hear from you, and we'd certainly love to help you. Perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be in touch. <laughs> Thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.